On a chilly winter evening on January 3rd, 2021, Hector Venancio Loya Sarabia was relaxing at home with his wife, Shereline Simas. She was feeling hungry, and so she asked her husband to fetch her some tacos. Hector obliged, and as he stepped onto their dirt driveway, it would be the last time Shereline would see her husband. Hector pulled into the popular local taco spot, La Huerita, and ordered the usual. As he walked out of the restaurant, food in hand, a hooded man ran towards Hector from behind, shooting him multiple times in the back. The customers inside the taco shop scrambled for safety as the hooded assailant retreated to a getaway vehicle. This harrowing turn of events was filmed by the shop's security cameras, and while I can't show the entirety of the footage here, this image captures the moment right before the murder. Shootings like this are not unheard of in the small border town of Tecate, Baja California. Lovingly dubbed El Pueblo Magico or The Magical Town, Tecate features a population of a little over 100,000 and a port of entry into the United States, though the only magical thing about Tecate might be the rate at which people disappear. As narco violence in Mexico has increased over the years, cases like Hector's have not only become common, but mundane. Este era Alex Ramos Murillo. Me mataron un animal, me mataron, él mataron a una persona que tenía todo mucho futuro por delante. Este hombre con un bebé en brazos y otras dos personas corren por su vida luego de desatarse una balacera. La policía inició la búsqueda y en esas operaciones encontraron un conjunto de restos humanos y termina siendo asesinado al recibir ocho hachazos en el rostro y en la cabeza. There is a long list of murdered men, women, and teens that have experienced grisly levels of violence not fit for YouTube. One especially bloody weekend earlier this year saw 10 dead bodies pile up in the small town in the span of 48 hours. The story of Hector Loya quickly gained traction in social media and was covered extensively by the news. It seemed Hector's death was significant because of Hector's insignificance. Hector had no prior convictions, no criminal connections. The killer who shot him in the back didn't even see Hector's face to see if he had the right guy. In the blink of an eye, a man fetching dinner for his wife disappeared because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the killer remains at large, with the local police failing to make any progress in the case. Have they been paid off? Are they too afraid to investigate? We don't know. But one thing is for sure. As justice escapes Hector's family, had the crime been committed only a few hundred feet to the north, this would have been a very different story. La Huerita Taqueria sits only four blocks away from the border, a massive wall separating the violent-stricken Tecate Baja California, Mexico from the safe and quaint Tecate California, USA. It's hard to see now what with Mexico's puritanical attitude towards drug use and the war on drugs that's plagued the country for decades now, but marijuana used to be so common that wild marijuana would grow unimpeded all over the Mexican countryside. It'd often be found inside indigenous hierbolarias who would use it to cure everything from asthma to hernias, which gave the plant a racialized working class association which was unacceptable to the nation's white aristocrats. When the military dictator Porfirio Diaz began trying to modernize Mexico with the help of foreign capital, the medicine of the poor and the downtrodden became the subject of a massive smear campaign. Doctors began claiming that if you smoked weed, you could develop temporary insanity. One tabloid from 1894 told the story of Alberto Gutmann, who robbed and killed a man with a machete due to the excitation that this powerful narcotic produces. Another from 1899 tells of Eulalio Andagua, who turned into a madman after smoking marijuana, attacked a guard, and then tried to kill himself by repeatedly bashing his head against the wall. Other doctors claimed that the use of marijuana would lead to the degeneration of the Mexican race. Not very subtle with the eugenics there. This reveals one almost universal truth about drug policy. When a nation bans a particular drug, it's almost never actually about the drug. Take another drug as an example, opium. 
Since the Chinese Exclusion Act prevented Chinese immigrants' entry into the United States, many found their way inside of Mexico, with the railway town of Torreón, Coahuila being a particularly popular destination. As the Chinese population grew, racist yellow peril attitudes regarding Chinese immorality spread, generating fierce racial tension in the city. This tension would violently erupt in 1911, already a year into the Mexican Revolution, many Torreón residents suspected danger could be coming as revolutionary forces closed in on the government-controlled city. Wu Lampo, manager of the local bank, wrote a letter to the community warning them of the threat. Brothers, attention, we advise all our people when the crowds assemble to close your doors and hide yourself and under no circumstances open your place for business or go outside to see the fighting. And if any of your stores are broken into, offer no resistance, but allow them to take what they please, since otherwise you might endanger your lives. As the community prepared for the worst, on the 13th of May, it finally came. Mexican revolutionary forces finally arrived at the city. Over the next three days, they began systematically massacring the local Chinese population. They raided their businesses and homes and attacked men, women, and children indiscriminately. In one instance, a Chinese man was pulled apart by horses tied to his arms and legs. In another, a child was bludgeoned to death against a lamppost. One newspaper reported that the heads of the murdered Chinese were rolled along the streets and their bodies were tied to the tails of horses. Amidst the massacre, there were a few Mexicans who showed solidarity. 70 immigrants were reportedly saved by a tailor who misdirected the mob away from where they were hiding. Another local, Edmina Almaraz, stood in front of her home where she housed her Chinese neighbors and shouted at the mob that they could only enter the house over her dead body. Despite these lone heroes, by nightfall, 303 Chinese people had been killed along with five Japanese. The massacre at Torreón was only a small blip of the anti-Chinese violence that was to come. Laws against smoking opium were passed, giving law enforcement an easy excuse to conduct raids on Chinese businesses, issue mass arrests, and forced expulsions from the country. By the 1930s, approximately 70% of the Chinese and the Chinese Mexican population were expelled from Mexico, and the perpetrators of the crime at Torreón all escaped justice. They argued the massacre was done in self-defense against an armed Chinese insurgency. It took Mexico 110 years to issue a formal apology for the crimes at Torreón and all those that came after. Remember, it's almost never about the drugs. The Mexican Revolution ignited a decade-long war that saw revolutionary forces struggle to unseat Porfirio Diaz from power. Once the dust settled, over one million lives were lost in the war, and because of it, drug use increased dramatically. By the 1920s, an entire bohemian stoner culture had developed in the fledging new country as successful revolutionary soldiers who had used the drug to numb the pain now used it to imagine what their political future would be. One especially romantic bohemian artist addressed a crowd in 1923 with marijuana in hand, shouting, It is the only transcendental value that Mexico, our country, has given the world. Marijuana. He continued, here is science, love, politics, everything you need to construct the monumental art that you dream of. He took a few hits, then put it down. He declared that the drug had no effect on him, for Mexico's artists were natural marihuanos. This revolutionary euphoria wouldn't last long. In 1920, the young nation signed onto an international anti-drug treaty with the United States that banned the cultivation and commerce of all products that degenerate the race. This prohibited not just marijuana, but harder drugs that had slowly trickled down from the medicine cabinets of the upper classes into the veins of the poor. Unsurprisingly, this did little to stop the drug trade. By 1943, Mexican opium, heroin, and morphine found its way as far north as New York, most of it hailing from the Golden Triangle, the birthplace of the modern drug trade. 
The origin story of the Golden Triangle is quite simple. Once lucrative towns found themselves in disrepair following the Great Depression, prompting mountain farmers to start harvesting poppies to make a living. In the most remote stretches of the Golden Triangle, some farmers didn't even know poppies were illegal. One farmer reportedly left the city one day to sell his harvest and was shocked when a police officer confiscated his goods. Furious, he went down to the station to make a complaint, only to be handcuffed and put behind bars. The sleepy trade remained peaceful for a long time as it was maintained by local sheriffs and mayors who charged taxes to the local narcos and used the money to fund public works. For the state of Sinaloa, this was especially lucrative. From 1944 to 1947, the Sinaloa treasury went from over 11 million pesos in the red to 1.3 million pesos in the black. In the same period, the state administration built 130 schools, 10 playgrounds, 2 teacher training colleges, and 2 art schools. In contrast, other state governments faced tax riots, bankruptcy, and declining public services. To Mexican authorities, the choice to participate in the drug trade was clear. During this golden era, it wasn't drug violence that threatened Mexican safety, but political violence. Wealthy landlords hired Sinaloan gunners and former revolutionaries to keep down radical peasants that demanded land rights in ferocious uprisings. And it was these mercenaries who learned the trade by murdering radicals that would become the narcos' future contract killers. Here, a regular pattern began to emerge. State authorities soon learned of the lucrative trade and began to replace the local leaders, sacking them and installing their own men. Soon, federal authorities would do the same to the states, elevating the trade to a federal enterprise that would fuel the Mexican economy that was struggling to meet its international debts. As the local racket became a state racket and the state racket became a federal racket, the changes in leadership would produce increasing levels of violence. But despite these hardening drug laws and the growth of the drug trade, some progressive Mexican doctors were trying out radical experiments in public health. Dr. Leopoldo Salazar Viniegra, serving as the head of the Federal Narcotics Service, was working on implementing a new national drug policy that emphasized public health and harm reduction. He believed that Mexico could create a government-regulated system of drug distribution, implement a public health campaign to educate people honestly about drugs, and expand the drug treatment system. His methods were unorthodox, to say the least. He would offer visiting Mexican officials cigars without telling them that it had weed in it to destigmatize the drugs. His infamy grew so large that even visiting American officials were warned by their Mexican counterparts that if Salazar offers you a cigarette, be careful that it is not a marijuana cigarette, as he is giving these out to all of his friends to prove that they are not injurious and he may experiment on you. After spending 14 years studying the drug, he released his landmark study, El Mito de la Marihuana, that came to the conclusion that weed did not in fact induce reefer madness. And it carved the path for the public health department to begin the first public health clinics where addicts could purchase affordable, small doses of drugs in exchange for medical treatment and eventual reintegration into society. One such addict spoke to the paper, we only want you to say the truth, that they dose us according to our physical state, so we can reintegrate into society and return to our jobs. Now they are doing this, tell your readers that we are thankful to the health department, very thankful. Another spoke about how drug prices had grown so high that they had to steal to get their fix. Through the clinic, he could get his fix for cheap and had begun cleaning himself up. He even had money left over to pay for rent and food. The early results of this program were promising, and it was just one segment of the sweeping reforms occurring in Mexico at the time. From increased workers' rights to land reforms, the revolution lived on in the struggle for progressive social policy. But this was unacceptable to Harry J. Anslinger, then U.S. Commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Upon learning about the program, he put an embargo on all shipments of medicinal drugs to Mexico to force the government to comply with his demands. Anslinger is a little-known figure in the early war on drugs. A racist liar and hysterical red baiter, the man has given us famous quotes such as, I wish I could show you what a small marijuana cigarette can do to one of our degenerate Spanish-speaking residents. 
the embargo was just one dirty trick he would use. On another occasion, he resorted to outright blackmailing Mexican leaders by revealing their secrets if they didn't fall in line. And unfortunately for us, the embargo worked. Mexican officials folded and by the end of the 1940s, Mexico had instituted anti-drug laws that were even more strict than the United States's. Anslinger had successfully used drug policy as a foreign policy weapon, and Viniegra was sacked from his position. From here, the counter-revolution had won out and the country was firmly set on a long, painful path. 1969's Operation Intercept was one of Nixon's cornerstone policies in his newly announced war on drugs. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. Under the guise of public health and narcotics prevention, the president ordered customs to search every single vehicle crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. The logic is simple. Search every vehicle, reduce the volume of smuggling. Makes sense, right? Well, like with every other policy we've seen, things were not as they seemed. In the words of attorney Gordon Liddy of Watergate fame, It was an exercise in international extortion, pure, simple, and effective, designed to bend Mexico to our will. The policy resulted in massive traffic backups around the border, with wait times reaching over six hours to cross. This substantially hurt the border tourism economy in Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez, and if Mexico wanted the iron grip of its neighbor to let up, it had only one solution – ramp up the war on drugs even further. The U.S. government soon funneled millions into Mexico in exchange for strong anti-narcotic measures, ranging from harsh new legal penalties that would soon imprison millions of dealers, a herbicide spraying program that would take the lives of unlucky children, and brutal new policing methods. If the traffickers kill one of us, then we will kill 40 of them in order to teach them that they cannot do this. They will pay and pay heavily for their actions. One Mexican official said, and kill they did, and rape, and torture. Down there, I really got an eyeful. US agents actually participated in the torture, anybody. It didn't matter shit who it was. They would actually participate in the torture of these goddamn people. One former agent retold a harrowing story of a suspected narco who was taken in for questioning. We arrested him and took him off to the holding cells. The Mexicans started getting a bit rough with him, and one of the American agents jumped in and started battering the hell out of the guy, too. They never gave him a chance to answer a question. They were really giving him hell, stomping him, kicking him. An agent took a pair of socks out and crammed them in his mouth so he couldn't scream and he couldn't answer the questions either. This was one of the lighter methods of torture. Other methods included waterboarding with shit-filled toilet water or water filled with spices, and hanging prisoners by their fingers and balls and electrocuting their testicles. Four traffickers who were tortured in Tijuana recounted their horrifying experience. After being captured, agents rounded up their wives to extract questions from the narcos. They brought my wife here and raped her. There was nothing I could do. I was all tied up. She cried and cried. They said, if you're not going to tell, we're going to kill you and your wife. Now where's the stash? One prisoner's wife endured so much suffering, she lunged towards a protruding nail on the concrete wall in an attempt to slash her own throat. This horrific level of violence slowly became emblematic of the drug war in Mexico following the 1970s. And while we usually associate gut-wrenching levels of violence with the narcos, make no mistake, it was the government that crossed that line first. And by the 1980s, the drug war had become the recognizable shit show it is today. Public shootings and standoffs became common as the system fell apart and drug lords turned against drug lords. Narcos had AKs, bodyguards, and armored vehicles, but all the protection in the world couldn't protect the biggest mafia bosses from being taken down. So the criminal underworld started turning to less than conventional methods for defense. Adolfo Constanzo was one such so-called narco satanist that offered his brujería for protection. Adolfo de Jesús Constanzo was born in Miami, Florida, when his Cuban mother, Delia González del Valle, was just 15 years old. Growing up, his family was anything but normal. His mother was a practitioner of her own brand of Palo Mayombe. Unlike other African diasporic religions that emphasize spiritual peace, 
balance, and tolerance, with practitioners using their faith to spread blessings, Delia practiced a palo focused entirely on hexes and curses, instilling a violent disregard for life in the young Adolfo. His earliest memories surround the secret ritualistic killings and mutilating of animals in their blood-stained home, with his mother telling him that the non-believers that neighbored them were worth less than the animals they sacrificed. Their neighbors would often find headless geese and chickens on their doorstep if their kids ever had an argument with Adolfo, a sign of the curse they had been imparted. In 1984, Constanzo left his mother and moved to Mexico City in the pursuit of fame and riches, using his knowledge as a sorcerer to gain notoriety. He started off with simple magic first, card readings and cleansings to slowly build a following. Over time, he gathered a reputation as something of a clairvoyant. And through his tricks, he earned himself a core following of men and women who followed his every word. The group would begin selling elaborate sacrifices with an extensive menu of beasts of your choice. Sacrificing a rooster would run you $6, goats, 30, zebras, a thousand, and so on. The more precious the animal, the stronger the protection spell. Some so strong that Constanzo promised his clients they'd be bulletproof to their enemies and invisible to the police. These showy rituals attracted richer and richer clientele, naturally leading Constanzo to rub shoulders with the upper echelons of Mexico's elite, from the biggest narco leaders to the heads of police. Eventually, he moved to a desert ranch in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, becoming a fully-fledged narco himself while running his cult on the side. But with the mounting violence of the drug war, his clients needed stronger protection spells, and such spells required bigger sacrifices. The cult began conducting brutal human sacrifices, sometimes kidnapping strangers off the street, other times sacrificing captured rival gang members. On March 13th, 1989, Constanzo had just finished another human sacrifice, a disappointing affair as his latest victim had not begged for his life as he had wished. He ordered his minion to fetch another victim, and so they left their desert ranch in search of prey. That night, 15,000 spring break tourists roamed the street of Matamoros, enjoying the nightlife of the border town. Among the crowd were Texas A&M students Mark Kilroy, Bradley Moore, Bill Huddleston, and Brent Martin. By the end of the night, Moore and Martin had separated from the group, heading towards Garcia's, a popular restaurant for American tourists. While Kilroy and Huddleston lagged behind, Huddleston felt the strong urge to take a piss, so he pulled away to a nearby alleyway to do the deed while Kilroy stood watch. As Kilroy waited for Huddleston, a man approached him inside a vehicle, asking him a question. The intoxicated Kilroy stepped closer to the vehicle before suddenly being grabbed by two men and forced inside the truck. Kilroy struggled to break free. He was an athlete, so he quickly managed to overpower the men and run away down the street before being intercepted by a second vehicle. Blocked from all sides, one of the men pulled out a gun. With no choices left, Kilroy entered the vehicle. Huddleston finished up and returned from the alley, but Kilroy was nowhere to be found. Huddleston assumed he had gone on without him and continued walking towards Garcia's. But when Kilroy didn't show up at the restaurant, the boys knew something was wrong. American tourists going missing in Matamoros wasn't anything new. In fact, before Kilroy, 60 tourists had already been reported missing that same year, most of whom would reappear a few days later with a nasty hangover from all the partying. But when Kilroy's uncle, a U.S. customs agent, heard the news, he put pressure on Mexican police to conduct a thorough investigation. This led to a widely publicized international manhunt for the abductors, abductors who the police knew very little about. They were so desperate for clues, they put Kilroy's friends through hypnosis to see if they'd remember anything. But a lucky break came when Mexican police were stationed near a routine checkpoint in the area. A vehicle blew past the post, and instead of stopping them, police decided to tell the vehicle to see where they were heading. The vehicle led them to Constanzo's desert ranch, where police waited in hiding until the vehicle left, allowing them to break in and conduct a search. Inside, they found occult paraphernalia, the remains of tortured animals, and a human brain inside a cauldron, the same cauldron Constanzo had used to conjure his spells. They quickly arrested the driver of the vehicle, who turned out to be one of Kilroy's abductors. Like dominoes, members of the cult began to fall, and the truth about Kilroy's disappearance was unraveled. 
After his capture, Kilroy endured a long night of torture and sodomization in the Colt's ranch before ultimately being decapitated by a machete. Despite these breakthroughs, police still couldn't locate Constanzo. Sources placed him everywhere from the south of Mexico to the west coast of the United States. However, officials noted that Kilroy's murder was remarkably similar to a string of murders in Mexico City a few years back. And so after interrogating the local witches and sorcerers in Mexico City, they zeroed in on an address. On May 6, 1989, they surrounded his apartment, leading to a shootout between Constanzo and his cult members and the police. After a 45-minute standoff, the cult was left with little ammunition, and so fearing capture, Constanzo handed his gun to one of his followers and ordered them to shoot him. After finally breaking in, police found Constanzo dead on the ground, his reign of terror finally over. The nature of the case made it a media sensation, with both Mexican and US media portraying Constanzo as a satanic occultist. Palo Mayombe and other Afro-diasporic religions were similarly pulled through the mud in the media, with misinformation spreading like wildfire. The reality of Palo has been forgotten replaced by a stigma that's made it synonymous with human sacrifice and cannibalism in the eyes of many people in the United States and Mexico. The religion is so heavily stigmatized, most practitioners work in private, and it's a stigma Afro-Caribbeans continue to fight against today. You know, Palo is an ancient African tradition that originated in Congo. It is a powerful form of magic and African spiritualism. To some, Palo is a religion. To others, it is a magical path to attaining uh, a deeper level of consciousness. And with that, we turn the page on one of the strangest chapters of the global war on drugs. Despite some brief moments of rest in the war, with the continued militarization of the conflict, Mexico's drug violence has remained at record levels. Cartels rise and fall as we imprison their leaders, and each change in the drug trade produces an immeasurable wave of bloody infighting. While the drugs that are trafficked and the tactics the governments use might change, the story remains the same. One might ask, well, why do people even become drug dealers if the risk of death is so high? Well, you only need to sell a few grams of weed to dealers in the US to make the average annual salary in Mexico. And for many, the drug trade is all they've ever known. That's the world young Cruz would grow up in. Born in a poor village in Michoacán, Cruz lived in a shack with a dirt floor with little economic opportunity. Most villagers lived as subsistence farmers or would leave for better opportunities in the United States. Others, however, chose the drug trade. As Cruz grew up, his entire family became involved in the trade. Five of his brothers, three of his brothers-in-law, most of his cousins, even his mom was involved at some point. So Cruz followed suit, starting off as a lookout in the mountainous Michoacan landscape. As his brothers ascended up the narco hierarchy, Cruz had no ambitions for advancement, nor any interest in using drugs himself. To him, it was a simple job, and as the business became increasingly violent, it was this impulse that would save his life. Two of his brothers were killed, then four of his cousins, and then one of his brothers was disappeared. Since Cruz had not sought to advance up the chain of command, he had been safe from the waves of change, but not completely. His mother decided that she needed to save at least one of her sons, so she sent him off on a bus to the border, where Cruz crossed to the other side. He eventually got married, had children, and made a living picking fruit. For a time, life was good. Cruz had fully left his old life behind and was focused on the future. But when ICE conducted a workplace raid at the farm, he ended up getting swept up when he failed to provide proper documentation. At the detention center, the author of The Dope, historian Benjamin T. Smith, met Cruz working as his immigration lawyer. Cruz told him his story and how he was fearful fearful for his family and his future. He pleaded that if he were to return to Mexico, the cartel would surely take him out. 
Cruz laid it all out on immigration court. He told them all his stories, of his hardships, of how he was essentially forced into the trade of his dead family members, and of how he was just a simple farmhand. But despite his efforts, his pleas fell on deaf ears. ICE argued that Cruz was a violent psychopath. They disregarded his history and implied that he was actually here to sell drugs to kids. The judge, unsurprisingly, agreed with ICE. Two months after his hearing, he was put on a plane and flown back to Mexico. As of this writing, his status is unknown. <laughs> 